Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, I'm so excited today for our topic, which is baptism of fire. And I praise God uh, because the more we grow learning about Him, the more we know about Him, uh, the more we understand the things uh, about our faith. Because that is important. For faith comes from by hearing and hearing the word of God. Okay, so there are lots of things to be discussed. And uh, before we start, of course, we have to seek our Father in heaven to guide us through the power of the Holy Spirit, that he will be the one to teach us. Let us pray. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we gather together right at this moment of time to discuss things about baptism of fire. It has not been much uh, discussed or taught by other preachers and teachers, and, but it is part of the three baptisms that has been mentioned in Matthew chapter 3. Baptism in water, baptism of the Holy Ghost, and baptism of God. Father, I pray that let the Holy Spirit be the one to teach us, to lead us in our study, that your name be glorified. Father, I I have nothing, I don't know anything except through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let be the one, let you be the one to teach us in our start. I give you back all the glory and honor in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so without further ado, let's go and start the fire. Okay, <laughs> start the fire. Uh, uh, when I say that, I remember during the times when I was still a teenager or when I was attending seminars, fellowships, some other things like that. Some, preach some preachers and teachers are really on fire. They are really on fire when they are preaching the Word of God. Now, some teachers, they are teaching that when they are on fire, they are telling that that is baptism of fire because they are very much, uh, what do you say, very much alive, in power. They have power in preaching. They are on fire. And when they say they are on fire, they say they are baptized with fire. But let us study what the Bible says regarding baptism of fire, okay? We all know, okay, that this was mentioned in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, as we discussed last time regarding the baptism, okay? Uh, this is the word of John the Baptist. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, to bear he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay. So last time we discussed about baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay. The moment you believe our Lord Jesus Christ, you are baptized with the Holy Ghost because it is your spirit has been emerged by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll show you in our diagram again. Okay. We know that man is having a body, having a soul, and a spirit. So man is a spirit. Having a soul, living in a body. So man itself is a tripartite being. So when you say it's a tripartite being, there are three parts. The body, the soul, and spirit. So in Matthew chapter 3 verse 11, they have, we have baptism of water, baptism of the Holy Ghost, and baptism of fire. So body, soul, spirit is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And then in Matthew 3.11, we mention here, Baptized with water, baptized with the Holy Ghost, and with fire. So we mentioned three here also. So this three connects with the tripartite being of a man. So I hope you understand the point that uh, baptism of water is connected to our physical body. Baptism of the Holy Ghost is connected to our spirit. And then baptism of fire is connected to our soul. So, this is the illustration for that. As I uh, shown to you last week, last time, last discussion. So, when, once you believe the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit 
will baptize you will emerge your uh, your spirit will be fully emerged in the power of the holy spirit so you are not on your own anymore you are all belongs to god you are under the protection and the guidance of the holy spirit you are now a new being a new creature because of the power of the holy spirit now you are fully wet with the holy spirit means fully immersed with the holy spirit your spirit and then now we have water okay baptism of water and we know that water when your body is submerged in water it's as a symbolical that you are showing to the people that you are really a property of god you are showing to the people that you are now connected you have relationship with the father in heaven through our lord jesus christ and the manifestation of that is the baptism of water okay and then holy wet in water and then lastly the word okay the word of god the bible now it will baptize you with fire so the word is mentioned as wash okay wash by the word later on i will explain to you why the word wash the soul okay by using the word of god it is the process of regeneration so you are now regenerated because once you become a born again or once you become a new creation creator or creature of god it does not mean that your mind has been changed your way of thinking has been changed your mindset has been changed no it has to regenerate okay and how it will be regenerated by the power of the word sanctified by the word washed by the word and this is actually baptism of fire why i said that this baptism of fire i'll explain uh, later on as we continue our discussion so what is baptism of fire we have to read in luke chapter 12 verse 15 okay in luke chapter 12 verse 15 it says the lord jesus christ is telling to his disciples but i have a baptism to be baptized with so here you can understand that uh the lord jesus christ is telling i have a baptism to be baptized with but our lord jesus christ is already baptized with water in march chapter 3 okay in march chapter 3 he was already baptized in water by john the baptist so here he is mentioning i have a baptism to be baptized with and how am i strengthened till it be accomplished so he's telling that i need to accomplish this kind of baptism that i am going through okay another thing in march chapter 20 okay march chapter 20 verse 22 okay in march chapter 20 verse 22 but jesus answered and said you know not what you ask okay so the story of here is the two disciples james and john the son of zebedee along with their mother they came to our lord jesus christ and they are asking if possible that his two sons or uh, her two sons should sit at the right hand of our lord jesus christ they are, are requesting for a seat in the kingdom of god that they are going to sit on the right hand of our lord jesus christ and this is the answer of our lord jesus christ but jesus answered and said you know not what you ask are you able to drink to drink of the cup that i shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that i am baptized with they say unto him we are able so our lord jesus christ has compared the cup that he should drink with the baptism that he should be baptized so 
when he said baptism that I am baptized with means it's like a present tense that is continuously happening. Okay. And then he, our Lord Jesus Christ, compared it with a cup that he should drink. And continuation on verse 23, he said, and he said unto them, unto them, you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I baptized with. So again, he mentioned the cup and the baptism that he's going to be baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, it's not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. So the Lord Jesus Christ is telling to the, the sons of Zebedee that they might also have the same baptism like our Lord Jesus Christ that he will be baptized or drink the same cup that he's going to drink. Okay, so what the Lord Jesus Christ is trying to say, and what is that? They need to drink and they what what baptism is he referring referring to in john chapter 18 18 verse 11 then jesus said unto peter put up thy sword into thy she into the sheath the cup which my father have given me shall not shall i not drink it so again this is the time when the lord jesus christ uh is going to be arrested by the Pharisee soldier in the garden of Gethsemane. And then the Lord Jesus Christ said to Peter, Peter, don't use your sword. Put it back to the sheep. I need to drink the cup that the Father wants me to drink. So I need uh, to finish the baptism that, I'm, that I am baptized with. So there is no other baptism that God, our Lord Jesus Christ, is referring here. Because when you say baptism of water, he's already baptizing water. When you say baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is present with him. So what kind of baptism is talking about here? There's no other thing but baptism of fire. And then in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, Remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So from here, you can understand that, uh, from here that you can understand that uh, if our Lord Jesus Christ is requesting not to drink the cup, not to be baptized on the baptism that he's going to receive. But nonetheless, the Lord's prayer is, not his will, but the will of the Father. So there's something that this cup that they the, that our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't want because it is really difficult. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, nonetheless, nevertheless, not my will, but thy, but thine be done. So what is this cup? Jesus has to drink and even requested to be removed and it is equally compared to baptism. And what kind of baptism? Of course, that would be none other than baptism of fire. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, again, I'm going to repeat. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for men. So here in Matthew chapter 20, he's telling to them why the reason he came, he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life for a ransom, uh, a ransom for many. So our Lord Jesus Christ know exactly his purpose his role, his duty, why he came into this world. Not to be served, but to serve and give his life to the, to the world. So uh, the point of that is Jesus Christ 
know why he is um, here on the world. And then in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Now, Isaiah 53 speaks about, the whole chapter speaks about our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the claim of the Jewish community that Isaiah 53 is there, uh, it's referring to the nation of Israel. But how uh, uh, how you can uh, understand, or if you are going to read Isaiah chapter 53, it directly refers to a certain person. And of course, we all believe that Isaiah 53 is a prophecy that is what going to happen in our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is already preordained what are the things that our Lord Jesus Christ is going to do while here on earth. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ requested, if possible, let this cup remove, or I should not drink about this cup, or should not drink at the cup. So, why? What is in that cup? Because in the, in the cup is the will of the Father, or the, the duty, the role that he's going to do. He will be cut off of the land of the living. And then in verse 9, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So the Lord Jesus Christ knows exactly that he is going to die for the people. That is his baptism of fire. That is his role. Okay? Based on the verses that we just read, it is the will of the Father. It is the will of the Father that Jesus must come to earth and give his life for ransom and, and believe for the ransom and to believe on him, to believe on our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the plan of the Father to the Son. That is the will of the Father to the Son. And the Son must drink that cup, must be baptized on that baptism of fire in order to fulfill the will of the Father. So once we believe in Christ, we are baptized of the Holy Ghost and it will abide with us forever. So we know that, we already explained that previously, baptism of the Holy Ghost. That baptism of the Holy Ghost comes immediately once you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and it will abide with you forever. As mentioned in John chapter 14, verse 16, And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even in your afterlife, the Holy Spirit will abide in you. Because the word forever means from the moment that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will not depart from you. As long as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And along with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is the baptism of fire. So when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, then you enter now in the baptism of fire. When you are not yet a Christian, the plan for you is to be saved. There is no other plan. Even... Uh, the Father will plan for you regarding the kingdom. If you are not being saved yet, it will be nonsense or invalid or it will be useless. Because the primarily goal to a certain people or to certain person is first he must be saved. Okay? He must be Say, and after that 
person has been saved, what will happen next? Once you are saved, then the plan for you now is to fulfill the will of God in your life. And that is baptism of fire. I, along with the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the baptism of fire. Once you are saved, then God has already ordained a plan for you, only for you, specifically for you, to fulfill His will here on earth. So I hope you understand and you got the main point regarding that. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. The Lord, the Lord Jesus God, the, the Father God said to the nation of Israel, For I know the thoughts that I think toward of you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So you can see here that God has a plan towards us. But the first plan of God is for you to be saved. And once you are saved, then there's another plan. And that is to give you an expected end, a total peace. But in other translation is to give you a future, to give you hope. Now, you might be telling uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 is actually mentioned for the nation of Israel during the time of their captivity. That God has a plan for them, a plan of peace, not of evil, to give them an expected end. That they will not be in captivity for the rest of their lives because God has a plan for them. So this refers only to the nation of Israel. Even though it's referred to the nation of Israel, you can take it personally. Why? Because in Galatians chapter 3 verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham, who is Abraham, the father of Israel, might come unto the Gentiles who are the Gentiles. We are the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So the blessing of Abraham might come unto us through Jesus Christ. So whatever promises that has been given to Abraham, we as Gentiles have the rights to claim those promises also. That's the good news. That's a wonderful news that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Because during the time of the Old Testament, the prophecies of the prophets, they prophesied that the Spirit will come and He will be the comforter, uh, strengther, uh, healer, and so on and so forth. And that promise was given to Abraham, to the nation of Israel. But even though we are not Israelites or Jews, but we might or we could have those blessings of Abraham through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in verse 29, he said, If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed in, and heirs according to the promise. So the moment that we are now a Christian, you, we are now part of Abraham's seed. And when we are a part of Abraham's seed, then therefore, we also could claim the promises of God, the blessings of God that was mentioned to Abraham or to the nation of Israel. Okay? So... That's the reason why in some promises of the Old Testament, we as Christians, we claim that also because we are Abraham's seed through Jesus Christ. So in continuation, Psalms 32 verse 8, the plan of God, that I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go, and I will guide thee with my eye. So the Lord will give us the instruction will teach us the way that we should go. And he will guide us with his own eyes. So, this is the plan of God. This is what God will be doing. And apart from that, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But it is written, I not have seen, nor ear heard, neither 
have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. So there is what we call God had prepared for them that love him. So God is also preparing something to whom? To them. Who are those them that love him? So Jeremiah 29 11. I know have plans for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. So it is mentioned in Old Testament, and now in First Corinthians chapter 9, it's mentioned God also prepared unto us who love him. So God is preparing us, or God has a will unto us okay, in our lives. Therefore, fulfilling the will of God in our lives is our baptism of fire. I repeat, when, when you became a Christian, the Holy Spirit is with you, you enter into the baptism of fire. And in baptism of fire, God has already prepared a plan for you. A plan to prosper you and not to harm you. A plan to, for you to fit in the kingdom of God and what will be your role. So, baptism of fire is fulfilling the will of God in our lives. Our life is immersed in fulfilling that purpose. So, here the immersion of our soul or our being is being emerged. And it is emerged with the promises of God. The same, uh, the same with Christ that um, when he said that he's being baptized and drink the cup, the same thing that we will be facing the same as with Christ. So your purpose, your duty, your role, in the kingdom of God, that is your baptism of fire. Because if I'm going to tell you, when God has given you a role or a duty, would God send you immediately to the battlefield without giving you some trainings? Some, some head up, some, some things to learn about, would he send you immediately? Of course not. There is a process. And that process will take time depending on how we respond to the word of God. So you did not become a Christian for nothing. So once you receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and the Holy Spirit baptize you and you are sealed with the promise of uh, with, with, you are sealed with the promise that you are now saved that you are now belongs to God uh, it ends or it means that it's already ended or nothing will come follow after that of course you did not become a Christian for nothing once you become a Christian you are now valuable just as the same like every Christians in the world. So when you say valuable, there's something in you that needs to be taken care of, needs to be refined, needs to be purified. So that valuable thing is compared to a gold. Okay? How we could refine and purify the gold. We refine and purify the gold by means of fire. By fulfilling the will of God in our lives is a process. So that process is baptism of fire. So that process alone, you are in baptism of fire. The same thing with our Lord Jesus Christ. That I should drink the cup that God or the Father has given unto me. 
I should be baptized of the baptism that I should be baptized with. So, baptism of fire is fulfilling the will of God in our lives is a process. So, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, I would like to ask you one thing. Okay? How could you walk uh, in them by your own way of understanding by your own way of knowledge of good and evil remember that in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 he said that his workmanship so who is working here actually who is working here it is God we are his workmanship Created in Christ Jesus unto what? Unto good works. Now, many times I've already told and teach regarding good works. Many people are doing good works. But the question is, is that good works accepted to God or not? The only good works that is accepted to God is the works that is manifesting, manifesting the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Because apart from the fruit of the Holy Spirit, whatever manifests from your body, apart from the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is what we call self-righteousness. Self-glorification of good works. So that is not the workmanship of God. When you say workmanship of God, He is the one working in us and Whatever good things that is coming out of us, it is not us. It is the workmanship of our Father in us. And when, when you say it is the workmanship of the Father in us, now once you are doing good works, it is already accepted by God. Why? Because that is the good works that is produced by the power or by the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So we should walk in them as per the instruction from our Lord Jesus Christ. So why I should tell you this? Because in your, when you are fulfilling the will of God in your life, you are going to walk in them. Okay? When God is asking you to do something, that is not an instant or one time it is a process it is a process for example when i was a teenager learning the bible during those times when i was 14 years old i could not teach the way i teach now way back those years why because i am a workmanship of god i have to undergo this baptism of fire now, if you are going to ask me the way or uh, ask my personality before when I started as a Christian and my personality now after being a Christian, I'm going to tell you there are huge difference because the workmanship of God is working in me and I am walking in them and that is baptism of us. How did I come to know? How did I come to know about the good things in the sight of God? If I am not studying the Word of God, how could I come to know what are the things that is acceptable in the sight of God if I am not studying or reading the Word of God? So, as, as time goes by, if I continue studying, reading, studying, reading the Word of God, then the workmanship of God is now operating in my life. And then whatever things that I be doing to the people, good works, that is the workmanship of the Father. So once you become a Christian, you became a newborn in Christ's kingdom. 
And we know all that about in John chapter 3, verse 3. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Uh, if anyone, anybody or anyone being in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passing. All things become new. So once you become a newborn in Christ's kingdom, what will happen next? Okay. The first step as a new Christian is to be baptized in water. So, I am going to clarify again. Once you believe the Lord Jesus Christ, you are baptized with the Holy Ghost. And once you are baptized with the Holy Ghost, then you entered into baptism of fire. Now, once you entered into the baptism of fire, for those who truly baptize in the Holy Ghost, the first step that they need to do is to be baptized in water. So that the spirit, the soul, and the body are fully baptized or fully emerged in the power of God. Because man is a tripartite being. And to be honest, the Bible is very clear. How can a person be able to teach and preach and disciple other people if that person itself, himself or herself, is not baptizing water? There's a story in the Bible where Moses was instructed by God to go back to Egypt after Moses was speaking in the burning bush, okay? And then Moses refused to follow God, but, but then and again, he obeyed because Aaron was there to support Moses. So while they are going back to Egypt, you know what happened? The angel of death is going to strike on Moses. You have to understand, God instructed Moses to do a certain task. So maybe that is his uh, baptism of fire, or not maybe that is his baptism of fire, that is his cup that he should be drinking, that he should be going to Egypt and save his people. But on the way, the angel of death is coming to kill him. And you know what the wife of Moses did? He's, she circumcised the sons of Moses. What is circumcision? Circumcision is very important to Jewish people, to the Israelites. Because once you are circumcised, then you truly embrace and you truly uh, uh, expressing that you are God's property. So that is a covenant of God to Abraham that all male must be circumcised. And anyone who is not circumcised, they will be cut off. Moses knows that. But he did not circumcise his children. So the angel of death is going to kill them. But because of the wife of Moses, he, she was able to save them by circumcising their children. So what I'm trying to tell here, before we are going to do the, the mission that God has given unto us, the first step that a new Christian needs to do is to be baptized in water. You are baptized with the Holy Ghost. You entered in the baptism of fire. Then to, to manifest and to show the manifestation that you are truly um, God's property, then you must be baptized with water. Actually, water baptism is a deeper study also because when you are baptized with water, you are not on, only cleansed with the um, sin or they're telling that um, cleansing by uh, when you are immersed in water, submerged in water, once you comes out, you are a new person, as mentioned in Romans chapter 6, that you came along with the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if I'm going to ask you, the Lord Jesus Christ himself also had water baptism. 
he did water baptism, but he did not commit anything that is wrong. So once he comes out, he is not a new person. He is still the new person. He is still the same person as he was. Because there is no sin in him. So why our Lord Jesus Christ needs to be baptized in water? That is only a side track. Okay, so in continuation to what we are studying right now, the first step as a new Christian, you must be baptized with water. You cannot fulfill any duty of God unless you are baptized with water. Because from the very beginning, how can you tell to the people that they should obey God, they should follow God, they should believe the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are alone yourself was not able to follow the ordinance of God that we should be baptized in water. So a baptism of water is very, very important also for a Christian. They should not take it for granted. They should take they should not take it very lightly. It is as serious as serious as your life. Because you cannot fulfill the baptism of fire that God has given unto you unless you are baptized with water and light. Oh. Otherwise, you will be killed. Being baptized in water is to fulfill the commandment of Christ and show our identity in Christ. Mark 16, verse 16, He that believeth in the baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be done. So, as a newborn, a new creation in the kingdom of God, we must feed ourselves with milk. So once you became a Christian, if you are going to throw back uh, your situation before, you can compare yourself before and after or at this moment of time. You will see there are lots of changes. It is a very fearful thing that after so long being a Christian, nothing has been changed in your life. Then, what happened to your baptism of fire? Is it not working properly? Is, is it not, you are not being purified and sanctified? As we grow old in our Christian life, there must be change. Change is important to Christian life, to Christian life, because this is the truth. If a Christian is not changing, the reason why he's not changing is because he is not listening anymore or studying anymore the word of God. The, the one thing that could change our life is not based on our own decision. Oh, I would like to change. I would like to be like this. I would like to be like that. That is what we call a worldly sorrow or worldly repentance. A godly sorrow is, I will change. is because I experience the goodness of God in my life. And what is the goodness of God? Nawala ba? What is the goodness of God in our life? The goodness of God in our life is all found in the Bible. But to be realistic to all my brothers and sisters, Yes, I know that all the goodness of God is already in the Bible. But it will not have anything to do with you unless you have experienced it personally in your life. When it comes to relation to our Lord Jesus Christ, it is personal. A relationship to God is personal. So unless that word of God, the Bible itself, will not be active and realistic, and means uh, consuming us, there will be no change. Because the only things that the rightful change or 
a godly sorrow or a godly repentance that is accepted in the sight of God is we are changed not because of our decisions. We are changed because of the goodness of God that we experience his goodness in our life. Because in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it is very clear that the goodness of God is the things that lead us to repentance. So if there's no goodness of God and you change something in your life, that is not godly repentance. That is not godly sorrow. That is worldly sorrow. Because God has nothing to do with it. Godly sorrow, it is God has something to do with it. It is God that's that workmanship in us. It is God that is showing to us. It is God that giving us the example to follow. It is God that teaching us and uh, letting us know the things that we need to know and understand on his word. How can you say that God is true if you did not experience the word of God that he told in the Bible and was not able to perform it. You know, one thing that God makes God is because it's because God is a God of honor, which is whatever He says, it will come to pass. Whatever the words or promises that He has made, it will come to pass. Now Faith comes from the word of God. Now, once you heard the word of God, and this is the promises of God, the word of God, and this is his promises, now you hold on that word. Once you hold on that word, you put your faith and trust in his ways. Now, once you put your faith and trust in his word, and then the baptism of fire will come, the trials, the temptation will come to test you, how you are going to hold on that word. So after testing and trials passed by or came through it, you still hold on that word. And then God manifested himself through power by fulfilling his promises to you. Then you experience the goodness of God. Once you experience the goodness of God, then that leads you to believe God more and more. Because that satisfies your curiosity. Is God real? Is God really could make these things happen? As he mentioned in his word. And if God did, then it only means one thing. Your faith has been strengthened. So in continuation, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, a newborn babe desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So I told you, once you enter in the baptism of fire, the first thing that you need to do is, of course, you became a newborn babe. And as a newborn babe, you need to feed yourself with the word of God. You are not sent immediately to the battlefield. That you may grow. Okay? That you may Bro, so during the time that you are eating the milk of the word of the Lord, baptism of fire is already in the process. Why? Because all the mindset that you have during the times that you are a, a worldly person, secular mindset, uh, during the time that you are being planted, by the knowledge and the systems of this world, all of it, once you hear the word of God, it will become uprooted. It will destroy all the strongholds of your life and then it will consume the wrong kind of belief. So it is baptism of fire. It regenerates you. It regenerates your soul because soul is your mind, emotion, and your will. So it regenerates the mind, the way you think, the way you speak, the way you, you walk, the way you do things. Because your actions is based on the decision of your mind. If your mind is full of uh, uh, 
things that is worldly, then of course, what will manifest in your body are the things that is worldly. What will comes out of your mouth are the things that are worldly. But if your mind is already filled with the word of God, what will you expect? Of course, you will expect that person will have growth. It will grow. Then apart from this, then as you grow, okay, then as you grow, God will reveal to you his purpose unto you. So as a newborn, you will now start feeding yourself with the word of God. So once you feed yourself with the word of God, in the process of time, God will reveal to you, my son, this is your, my purpose unto you. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to do. This is what you need to fulfill. So it did not did during immediately when the time that you are born in Christ. It comes when it when you are growing, when God could see through you that, okay, my son is already growing. And uh, when he is growing, God could see that, okay, he, he will be able to do this now. He will be able to do that now. Then God will give him the task according to his measure of faith. So, Psalms 32 verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. So our Lord Jesus Christ will be teaching us the way where we should go. Because as we go, slowly by slowly, God will reveal to you his purpose in your life. God will reveal to you what are the things, the cup that you need to drink, the baptism that you need to be baptized with. In fulfilling his purpose in our lives comes with temptations and trial of our faith. So when we, why God has to train us? Why, why God has to uh, give us the learnings? Because the enemy is there. There will be temptations. There will be testing of our faith. The enemy will do that. And God allowed it because this will be the test of our faith. First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. So our faith will be tested. And what is faith? Faith is what on you have believed on His word. On what you have believed on the promises of God. If you believe that God will protect you, then God will protect you. And you will be tested on that faith. Okay, you are telling God will protect me. That God will protect me. Okay, then you will be tested in your faith on how you declare and proclaiming that God will defend you or protect you. Then there will be trials on that. The devil will come, okay, is God really going to protect you? Okay, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to do that to you. Can you say that God's still going to protect you? So there will be a testing of faith. But the more we've been tried by fire, what will happen? The more we believe in Christ. Let's move on, okay? You know, there's much more exciting part. This is why it is called baptism of fire. Why it is called the baptism of fire? Because our faith will be tested. So when you say baptism of fire, our faith will be purified, sanctified, cleansed. Okay? Fire is used in purifying the value of our faith comes with the great purification. There is what we call the value of our faith. All of us, I'm not telling the value of each person. All of us is valuable in, our, in the sight of God. There's no extra special in the sight of God. We are all equal in the sight of God. 
but there is a certain value of our faith that makes us different. Your measure of faith will not be the same on my measure of my faith. There's a different measure of faith of each and every one of us. But the more purification, the more baptism of fire that has been tried in fire, our faith has been tested in fire, the more valuable is our faith. So our faith becomes more valuable. For example, again, another example for this is when, the time, when I started teaching the Word of God, I am not this much powerful as I used to be than before. But because of the trials, because of the baptism of fire, because of the purification in my life, that all the words of the Lord that I have studied in the Word of God has been applied, experience in my life, and hold on that faith, my faith becomes more valuable. And when your faith becomes more valuable, you know what will happen? You will be lead to guide another people's faith to become valuable as the same as your faith. And that is what we call discipleship. We must put the value of our faith first with the great purifications before we will be able to uh, purify and bring more value to the faith of other believers. It must be coming from our side, experiences with the great purification. When I say great purification, there will be lots of tests, lots of trials, lots of uh, testings that is going to happen. But, if we were able to surpass that, the value of our faith becomes valuable, more, more valuable. So let us watch the purification process on how they, this is just a few minutes, okay? Hey guys. I brought you today to a precious metal refinery because I want to show you the process that metal goes through as it's being refined. Come take a look with me. Now, the process of refining fine metal starts when gold, silver, platinum, and palladium are delivered to the refinery in several impure forms, some still connected to false teeth and other creepy stuff like that. The lots of precious metals are weighed and tabulated. Then the lots are combined with flux, which looks a lot like you're actually making matters worse by pouring a bunch of dirty sand in with the metal. But it's actually a very important ingredient. Wait, I'll, I'll check. Flux and the impure metal is placed in a vessel. Let me repeat that. Okay. Hey guys. I brought you today to a precious metals refinery because I want to show you the process that metal goes through as it's being refined. Come take okay. a look with me. Wait a second. I'm just checking. Hey guys, I brought you today to a practice model of the final because I want to show you the process that metal goes. Wait a second, let me check how to show that video. 
Hey guys, I brought you today to a precious metals refinery. Okay, let us hey watch. Guys, I brought you today to a precious metals refinery because I want to show you the process that metal goes through as it's being refined. Come take a look with me. Now the process of refining fine metal starts when gold, silver, platinum, and palladium are delivered to the refinery in several impure forms. Some still connected to false teeth and other creepy stuff like that. The lots of precious metals are weighed and tabulated, then the lots are combined with flux, which looks a lot like you're actually making matters worse by pouring a bunch of dirty sand in with the metal, but it's actually a very important ingredient. This flux and the impure metal is placed in a vessel called a crucible. This is made from material that can take the heat better than the material inside it. So the crucible is then put into a melting furnace that transforms the metal and flux into a molten material, usually within 30 to 45 minutes. The crucible is then removed and the molten material is poured into a mold, sometimes shaped like a brick or other times like an inverted cone. Especially when they use a lot of flux and the cone-shaped mold, the flux fuses with the undesired matter to form a slag that is lighter than the precious metals. The slag naturally floats to the top of the mold, leaving a pure button of metal below. You can then easily separate the metal button from the slag. Once the whole lot has been melted and sampled, it's then remelted and recooled into grains about the size of BBs in order to speed up the extraction process. The grains are then placed into a mantle where an acid solution is used to dissolve the metals into a liquid form. Once the metals are fully dissolved, chemists use other substances to induce reactions that extract the exact metal they are looking for. The results are that you end up with an absolutely pure piece of gold, silver, platinum, or palladium. Now this process, although it may seem a little foreign to your typical day, is actually something that you need to understand inside and out. And here's why. The Bible, when it talks about God testing us, it doesn't use the definition for testing that we automatically think of. When we hear about tests, we think of exams and quizzes to see how much we've studied and how well we can answer those questions at a moment's notice. But man, have I got some great news for you today. When the Bible says that God tests us, it consistently uses the metallurgic term for refining precious metal. God does not test you to see how much you know or to find out where your breaking points are. He knows you inside and out. He knows the beginning, middle, and end. He already knows more about you than you do. So that's obviously why the Bible doesn't say that God is up there testing us like a difficult to please teacher at finals week. He's doing something completely different. He's trying to make you more precious. He's trying to make you more valuable, not in his eyes, but in the eyes of everyone else around you. He already values you so much that he paid the ultimate price to buy you back from the enemy. He's not testing to see how serious you are. He wants to purify you, to remove all of the things within you that are holding you back from the revolutionary that he created you to be. That's why you might be going through an experience right now that you feel like the heat has been really turned up in your life. Watching the refining process probably reminded you of this past year with all of these extreme conditions of heat, cold, and acid. Just know that you are safe as long as you are in God's crucible. He can use even these fiery trials to help you become more like Him. And to begin to see that with each stage of the process, that He is strengthening you and healing you and purifying you in a way that will help you lean confidently into the indestructible arms of your loving God. So let Him refine you a little bit more today. And don't get scared when He turns up the heat. He's just making you more precious. Okay, that is a very good... Now let me share the screen again. So that is a very good. Actually, when I was watching that, I was also touched.
I got a uh, short description. Okay. In continuation to that, uh, this is a raw gold, same as our mind and our heart as a newborn Christian. So, think of it as your mind. Okay? Because transformation of a human being comes first from the mind. All your actions are based on the decision that you have made in your mind. Even in believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the decisions have been made in your mind. So once there are new teachings from the Lord, from the Word of God that was put in your mind, then it will be tested. Okay, It will be tested. So raw gold, same as our mind and our heart as a newborn Christian. And then it will be purified with fire. So how it will be purified in fire? God is going to check or to test all the words that you have put in your heart if you truly believe in that word. Because how can you say to me, that you truly believe on something if I am not going to test you for that thing. Okay? Many people, okay, I will stay by your side as long as I live. I'll be with you as long as I live. Okay? Then how can you say that what they are telling is true? When the situation comes, a difficult situation comes, and that would be the testing if whatever he said is true so the same thing with us when we believe something from based on the word of course when we are listening from the word of god listening to the teachings of the word of god you are listening to me right now okay and then you accept it and believe it in your heart now how god going to know how deep is your belief in that word if it is not been tested by fire or tested by situation, conditions, or circumstances surrounds you. The circumstances around us is actually is the one purifying it. I have been so many difficult situations in my life. And even at this moment of time, I'm going to tell you honestly, I am really in a very, very difficult situation. But Despite of all difficult situations, because I have already experienced something in my life in the past that I was able to get through it, then that gives me the courage and the strength to get through on this situation again. Because I have tested, not only God tested me, but I have proven that God's word is faithful. God is faithful. So my belief in the word of the Lord has been purified. Purified by the circumstances that is happening around me. How I'm going to hold on that word. For example, um, the, the Lord said, okay, be silent, be still and know that I am God. Okay, we know that works. Be still and know that I am God. When you are in a difficult situation, when people are trying to push you down, when people are trying negative words against you, they are, they are trashing talks about you. But the Lord spoke to you and then told you, He said, be still and know that I am God. And then you say, okay, Lord, I hold on your word. I trust on your word. That I will be still. I will not be talking anymore against them. I will not talking regarding these things. I'll keep silent. So the situation comes. They keep on trash talking. They keep on telling negative things. They, they, they bombarded you with all the things. But you, you believe that God said to you that be still and know that I am God and you believe in that then once you get through over it your faith has been purified been tested that your faith is really true and you know what will happen 
the more that you will hold on to faith. When God is going to work on your situation, beyond on your imagination, on your thought, the way you think or plan, you did not plan for anything, but God did something to those people who is trying to hurt you, to trash talks you, to give negative things about you, uh, tell, telling bad things about you, even though it's not the truth. And then you come to know that this is what happens to them. Then you will say, God is truly faithful. God is truly faithful. My faith has been purified by the circumstances. Now, when the next situation will come again, and the word of the Lord came unto me and said, Okay, uh, forgive your brothers. Forgive your sisters. Although it's very difficult. But because your faith has been purified, okay, Lord, I will forgive because you told and I trust you. And then you will come to know, you will be at peace, you will be at calm, means uh, you are being, uh, you will not worry as such because you know that your God is a faithful God and he will not abandon you. So, when our belief in the word of God is being purified by fire, baptism of fire means the circumstances around the afflictions around us, it will strengthen our faith. It will strengthen. It is a challenge, but, but the point is there is a promise from our Lord Jesus Christ, which I'm going to tell. Okay, So once it is refined, all the unwanted stuff will be removed. The greatest unwanted stuff in my mind, in our mind as a Christian, is doubt. And because of uh, the doubt, because of fear. So the root cause of everything is fear. You fear. That's why you doubt. If you don't fear, you don't doubt. So the root of all these things, the root of uh, having not a true faith or refined faith is because you fear something. But if your faith has been refined, it will become a valuable thing. Why it will become valuable? Because you are not going to exchange it with anything that is materials in this world. When you say purify, for example, if I have a raw gold here, and then I have a purified gold here, so which one will be expensive? A raw gold or a purified gold? Of course, the purified gold. So once your faith becomes more valuable, then your life will become more valuable. All the situations when you are going to see around you, that when you are looking to the people around you, what you are going to see, you see your worth in the sight of God because you know your value, because you know your faith in God. That whatever it takes, you have that courage, you have that confidence, you have that strength because you know God is with you. And why God is with you? Because you know that your faith has been purified with the circumstances during the time when you are in the process or in the baptism of fire. So, to continue in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, he said, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of application. So that is the reason why an answer to the questions, why God allow sufferings, pains, afflictions. He allowed that not because he doesn't love us. He allowed that because he wants you to love more God, to love him more, to trust even more to him. 
So Proverbs 17.3, the finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. So once, once when God try our hearts, it does not mean that we will lose our salvation if we fail. So that is a wrong, I need to correct that because they are fear that they are having fear. What if I fail? What if I fail God? Would I lose my salvation? Of course not. Your salvation will not be lost. If you fail in something after you've been tried by God, you were not able to hold on his, on his word. You were not able to, to obey his word. Does it mean that you already lost and you failed? No. Okay, God tried our hearts. It does not mean that we will lose, lose our salvation if we fail. Okay. His purpose is for us to become like him. So the reason why God is trying us is because he would like to refine us to become like him. When how to become like him remember when our lord jesus christ was living here on earth he faced so many difficulties in this life but he was able to overcome each one of it and god wants us to become like him that whatever problems that is laid down in front of you whatever set uh, difficulties that is in front of you you will just simply cry to your father, say, I trust you, Father. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Jesus. In whatever circumstances I'm facing right now, I leave it into your hands. So much pain, so much affliction, but it leads you to trust more to your Lord Jesus Christ. First John 4, 17. Hearing us, our love made perfect that we may be boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in his world. So on how our Lord Jesus Christ lives here on earth, he wants us to live the same thing as he lives here on earth. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even here unto where you called, so there is a calling. That is the baptism of fire, you're calling. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Follow his steps. And not the steps of the multi-billionaire preacher. But follow the steps of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also suffered and leave us an example. First Corinthians 3.13 Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's works abide which shall build thereupon, thereupon he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, and he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So if we were not able to fulfill the will of God in some of the ways we fluctuate or we fall, it does not mean that you lost. The only thing that will suffer loss is the things that we are doing for the kingdom of God. But even though some, if sometimes we fail, it doesn't mean that we are not saved. We are still saved. Okay? So don't be afraid that what if God tested me and then I was not able to fulfill. Yeah. Is my salvation lost? Of course, it will not be lost. Okay? It's only the matter of reward will suffer loss. But we ourselves are saved. So the process of baptism of fire is to purify our thoughts and hearts and consume all posturing rubble. So we are already bombarded with the knowledge and the system of this world. We, as an early child, as we grow up, uh, they are teaching us all the things, the good stuff, you can say the good stuff. But in reality, 
that good stuff are not acceptable to God is just a filter out because the only thing that is accepted to God are the things that is in the grace of God, in the mercy of God, the things that is in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So, how is it purified? By tests and trials and temptation. So, the way we believe on the Word of God, it will be purified by tests and trials and temptation as I have mentioned a while ago. So why God wants to test it? So why God wants to test our faith? Wants to try our faith? To show to us that He is the God who fulfills His promises. So how can you say that God fulfills His promises? How can you say that God is faithful if we are not going to undergo this process. We should come to this process in order to learn that God is fulfilling all His promises. So the more that God can prove that His words are true, the more we love and put our trust in Him. As the same thing as I have given you an example, even the people around me, by the grace of God, they will desert me and leave me and forsake me and abandon me. My faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is all by grace and by His mercy, not on my own um, strength. But it's all by the grace of God. Have proven unto me already. The faith has already been purified. That I will not put my trust on men. But rather I will put my trust in my Lord Jesus Christ. Even all of the world will abandon me. If Christ is in me, that will be more than enough. Because if all of the people around all the world surrounding me are not there anymore so what will be the next step that god will do unto me then he will just carry me already to his bosom because i don't have any more purpose here on earth then i'll be carried with his bosom because the mindset of the true christians is it's always looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of his faith. The, our Lord Jesus cannot finish your faith if you are not looking unto him. So looking unto Jesus. Always look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. In First John chapter 4, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18. And there is no fear in love. This is the point why God allowed us to be tested. Because he wants to show how much he loved us by fulfilling his promises unto us. That whatever circumstances, he would fulfill his promises. And once you experience and taste the word of the Lord, the promises of God has been experienced by your life, then your love has been perfected unto Him. And once your love has been perfected, what will happen? Then it will cast out all your fear. And when all your fear has been cast out, then that removes also the doubt. Because I told you a while ago, the opposite of faith is doubt, right? But the root cause of doubt is fear. But if you don't have any more fear, then you have only faith. You will not have any more doubt, but you will have only faith. So perfect love casts out fear. And then because fear had torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. So my brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord is true. If you are still living in fear, it only means one thing. Your love is not yet perfected 
in him. How it will be perfected? First John 4, 19, the continuation of the verse. It is perfected because we experience his love unto us. We love him, not because we started loving the Lord, but because he first loved us. So what does it mean? You have experienced first the love of the Father, the love of the Son, and the love of the Holy Spirit personally in your life, you have experienced that. That makes your love perfect in Him. And when it is perfect in Him, you will go into love Him. Lord, I love you so much. Why? It's because I know you are a God that fulfills all your promises. And whether it is not fulfilled based on my own understanding, based on my own sight, I will still trust in you. Why? It's because you know that God can see things beyond on what your eye or mind can see. And you put your trust on Him because you trust Him more than you trust your soul. And how it all happened? Because you experienced the love of the Father. How did you experience the love of the Father? By passing through the furnace of afflictions, through this baptism of fire. In conclusion, baptism of fire is actually our cross to carry, the will of God in our life. And in fulfilling the will of God, the calling, the purpose of Christian life, and in fulfilling in the process is the furnace of application, the cup of indignation. So when you are going to fulfill the will of God, do you think when, when I am being called to preach and teach the gospel of Christ, is it as easy as you can see that the way I teach and preach it's as if nothing happens? You don't exactly know what is all behind of all these things. If I could only cry to each and everyone, I would do. But I have already cried to the Father that He alone could help me in this situation. And if I made the mistakes, then God revealed it to me. Let this pass to the baptism of fire. Let it be purified with fire. So that the next time, I will not be doing it the same again. And there will be improvement. I will grow in my faith. The promises is, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulations. But be of good cheer. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I have overcome the world. That is the promises of God. So even though we are in a furnace of afflictions, in the, uh, the, the time of tribulations, personal tribulations, personal persecutions, as a Christian, if you are not being persecuted as a Christian, then there will be a problem in that. That would be a big question, question mark. Because as a true Christian, they will be persecuted. Why? Because they will stand on what is right. And while you are standing on what is right, you will be persecuted by the people who doesn't want to stand on what is right and to benefit only for them. They will hate you. The Lord Jesus Christ already mentioned, the words hate me. From the very beginning, it already hates me. So the world will hate you also. So it's not a new thing. The world, we could not expect that everybody will accept us, everybody will be good unto us, everybody that you, they will like us. Some of them, and even inside the church, some people will hate us. But the Lord Jesus Christ already mentioned that the world will hate us. But let it be our prayer that if we are the one person that is wrong, then God lead us to the truth. 
and humble ourselves to the things. But if we are right, then God gave us the strength to have peace, to calm our heart from these difficulties. The other promises to, to this furnace of application, uh, affliction, affliction, the baptism of fire. There hath no temptation uh, taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. I told you, God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able. But will the with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to be able. So if you are going to think, Lord, this situation, this problem is too big for me to handle. I could not handle. Always and remember, God will not allow you to be tempted, to be tested above that you are able. That is his promise. That is for sure. That is his promise. Because not of us, all of us are the same. Okay. For I say, for I say, through the grace given unto me, to everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. So that's why God is telling us not to compare ourselves to anybody because God is dealing to every man according to the measure of their faith. My faith, my measure of faith is not the same measure of your faith. Because if we are having the same measure of faith, if I'm going to tell you right now, let us exchange our problems. Let us swap, make swap our difficulties in life. Would you like to accept my difficulties and then I will accept your difficulties? I don't think so. Because you don't know the measure of faith of each and every. So God will not test us beyond on what we can do. But God will deal to everyone according to the measure. Thank you so much to everyone. By the mercy of God and the grace of God, be with you all. And I pray that our lesson today have given you much learning and understanding about baptism of God. It is about to strengthen our faith to strengthen our love to our Lord Jesus Christ, to purify our faith in Him. Because the most important thing in, in the world, I could say, is your faith. Not gold and silver, not properties, not names, not popularities. The most important thing in this world is your faith. You should take care of it. You should allow God to test it so that it will be purified. Once it is purified, I'm telling you, it's not easy, but you will have that peace that no matter what happened, God said, you will have that peace. And he mentioned that in John chapter 14, spoken to you that you might have peace. Even the world is in tribulation. We will have them. Shalom everyone. May our good Lord be with you and guide you always. Shalom.